Good morning. This is Neil Paulimus. I want to welcome you to the third uh, webinar in our fall series of new features that have been added to Stack Graphics 19. Uh, <clears throat> you, uh, as always, are welcome to submit questions. And after I go through a relatively short presentation today, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, also, if there's any problems uh, screen, seeing my screen, you should see a PowerPoint slide right at the moment with a lot of squiggly lines. Uh, or hearing me, do, uh, do let us know right away. Um, today's uh, webinar is going to be relatively short. Uh, as I said last time, what I'm going to try to do this fall is to do more frequent but shorter uh, webinars covering particular topics uh, that I think will be of interest to those of you who are really trying to uh, to model real data, um, but also keep them short enough uh, so that uh, people can go to our website later on and uh, view the recordings um, without, um, you know, giving up uh, too much of their day. Also, uh, here in the U.S., we have a holiday tomorrow. It's our Thanksgiving holiday. And I know that uh, people that are, are listening in the U.S. are probably fairly anxious uh, to get going with the holiday. So I'll try not to... to, to let this go too long. Um, however, it is a very interesting topic. Uh, the topic for today has to do with fitting mixtures of Gaussian distributions. Okay. It's particularly important when the data that you're trying to model has more than one mode. Um, and I'll show you an interesting example of that in just a minute. Um, if the data have more than one mode, perhaps because the data set you're looking at is a combination of data generated by more than one mechanism, then the simple distributions like simple normal or gamma or Weibull distributions may not be adequate. Well, certainly are not adequate to model it. Uh, all of those distributions, all the many distributions we have in stack graphics have a single mode, a single peak. Um, and if you do have data that is bimodal or, or, or even more than two modes, then we need to do something like mix together two distributions. And as you can gather, uh, the topic today has to do with mixing Gaussian or normal distributions. Now we're going to look at two examples. Uh, we're going to look at modeling univariate mixture distributions where we have a single variable y uh, that we're interested in analyzing. And then we're, after we do that, we'll take a look at bivariate uh, mixture distributions, Gaussian mixture distributions, in which we have two random variables that we're trying to model. Now, what you should see on your screen right now is the basic model for a univariate Gaussian mixture distribution. Y is the variable of interest that we're trying to model. F of Y is the probability density function. And what you can see in this case, the probability density function is going to be the sum of K normal distributions. Each one of these terms over here is a normal density function. Uh, mu sub i stands for the mean of the ith distribution. Sigma sub i stands for the standard deviation of the ith distribution. And in a Gaussian mixture distribution, you take the sum of weighted normal distributions. P sub i is basically the proportion of the data that is modeled by the ith normal distribution. 
So what you have here is a mixture, the way I've written it, of K normal distributions, where the sum of the weights, the sum of the piece of I's equal one. That's necessary, of course, to keep the density function a legitimate density function with it with an area equal to one. Now our job typically if we're modeling data is going to be twofold. First off, to determine how many normal distributions we need to model the data. And secondly, once we've made that determination, to estimate the means, the standard deviations, and these P sub i's. The P sub i's uh, basically determining how many observations belong to each distribution. Okay. Now, to start off with, I'm going to take a, a look at an interesting data set, uh, one that I've looked at in some previous webinars. It's the duration of eruptions of the old faithful geyser at Yellowstone National Park. Now, the uh, old faithful geyser at Yellowstone is a very popular tourist attraction because it's quite regular. Uh, it erupts uh, quite a few times every day and uh, is fairly spectacular um, <clears throat> watching the, uh, the geyser spew water into the air and so forth. Uh, we're going to take a look at initially the duration of the eruptions. Okay, and as you'll see, I think you can already see here uh, by my slide that this is a not a unimodal distribution. In fact, there are a, a, a two pretty well-defined modes. But in order to do that, let me go back over here now to Stat Graphics 19. Okay, and call up that particular data now. I have the data in a file called Old Faithful. This is distributed with Stack Graphics, by the way, this particular data set. Uh, and uh, it was with 18 and it also is with 19. So if you want to model this particular data, uh, you can easily do so. The file Old Faithful actually has three columns in it. The first column is called duration. This is the length of the eruption of the Old Faithful Geyser in minutes. And these are actually consecutive eruptions. And there's a total, I believe, of 200 and I think it's maybe 272 different er eruptions. Yeah, it's 272 um, consecutive eruptions of the geyser. Now, in the second column, we have, incidentally, waiting time. That is the waiting time until the next eruption. Followed in the third column by the duration of the subsequent eruption. Okay, now, I'm going to start by just looking at duration. Okay, what can we say about the probability of the length of time that that eruption will last? And I'm going to start by looking at that data by going to Statlets and asking for an interactive histogram. Now, the interactive histogram comes up with a single graph that shows me the distribution of a particular variable. And I'm going to pick, in this case, uh, duration. OK, and what you can see if you look at, at this uh, histogram is there are definitely two modes. OK, I also typically like to go in here, increase the number of bars a little bit. 40 bars actually gives you a pretty good uh, look at the distribution of this particular variable. OK, now you can see that there are definitely two modes. OK, there's a peak down here at around two minutes and another peak here maybe up at around four and a half minutes there are short eruptions and there are long eruptions and not much in the middle now it's also interesting to click this uh, checkbox here 
which adds a non-parametric density estimator to the graph. And with a uh, slider bar here, I can reduce the width of the smoothing window. And you get a pretty good idea that according to this non-parametric estimator, that this definitely seems to be a bimodal distribution. Now, we're about to go ahead and fit a mixture of normal distributions to this particular data. And one of the criticisms I know you're going to have of what I'm about to do is that the data don't look particularly normal, those two distributions. In fact, one of them is skewed a little bit to the right. The other looks like perhaps it's skewed to the left. Okay, now uh, we could potentially take care of that somewhat by mixing more than two distributions. However, I, I should let you know that we are right now working on interfacing a program that will mix non-normal distributions. Because in this particular case, one might actually get a better model by mixing oh, gamma distributions or Weibull distributions or something like that. Okay. But let me show you what is in uh, version 19 at the moment. And once we put in uh, mixtures of non-normal distributions, I'll schedule another webinar and we'll take another look at the data. But let's see what we can do if we assume, in fact, that the underlying distribution is a mixture of normal distributions. Now, the first thing we need to do in order to run this particular procedure, if you haven't done so yet, is install R. Okay, the, uh, under the interfaces menu in Stack Graphics 19, you'll see interfaces to a number of different R libraries. If you haven't used R, R is a free um, programming language. And uh, we have a little bit of help over here for installing and configuring R. Okay, if you haven't installed R yet, you can do so by coming here and clicking on install, at which case it will take you to the website for R where you can go ahead and download the, uh, the procedure. Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, R language. Okay, so that's actually the first thing you need to do. You also need to go down here and click this button. It says install EM cluster, mass, and matrix. Okay, those are three R libraries. The main one that we'll be using today is one called EM cluster. That stands for expectation maximization cluster. Now, the reason it's called cluster is that one of the uses of the Gaussian mixture distributions is clustering the data, taking data and dividing it into two or more groups. Okay, it's treated as a machine learning procedure for clustering, similar to the k-means clustering procedure or something like that, but an alternative. Uh, and you'll see that one thing we'll get out of the program in just a moment is an assignment of each of the observations to one or the other of the distributions that we're fitting. Okay, well, let's go ahead now and actually do the fit. I've already installed R. So I'm going to go to interfaces, distribution fitting, univariate mixture distributions. And I'm going to tell it that the data are in the column duration. Now, when I tell it I want to fit a univariate mixture uh, model, the first thing it's going to ask me is how many components? How many normal distributions do you want in the mix? 
And I'll start with two because it looks visually like the, there are two modes to this particular distribution. Now, there are a number of ways that you can initialize the procedure. It's going to have to actually do a search, a search numerical search procedure to maximize the expected values. And you can choose one of three different procedures uh, or you could choose them each one at a time and see which gives the best result. I'm just going to go with the defaults, though. I'm just going to press OK. Now, there are a number of tables and graphs that I can get. Uh, by default, it'll give me an analysis summary, the estimated parameters, and a plot of the fitted distribution. I want to show you a couple more things. So I want to do some model comparisons, a goodness of fit test, and also some component assignments. OK, let's go ahead and press OK. At this point, it's going to call R and ask R to do the fit. And in fact, uh, it did. Uh, there is a picture of the estimated mixture of two Gaussian distributions. Now you can see they are normal distributions. So there's two symmetric components. And again, we might argue about whether that's a good fit or not, but with respect to mixing two normal distributions, that's the best fit. Now, uh, what have we fit? Well, if we go back here to the estimated parameters, you'll see that it's fit, it's determined two means, two standard deviations, and the P's, the P sub I's, those are the proportions. And it estimates that about 35% of the eruptions of the old faithful geyser come from a distribution with a mean of about two and a standard deviation of about 0.24. The other 65% come from a normal distribution with a mean of 4.27 and a standard deviation of 0 0.44. At least that's the best fit of two normal distributions. Now, as I said, if you wanted to use this procedure for clustering, you can come down here to component assignments and it will show you for every row in the data set what component it looks like that particular eruption belongs to. So the first row in the data set, it was an eruption of 3.6 minutes. That seems to belong to component two. The second eruption lasted for 1.8 minutes that appeared to belong to component one, and so forth. Okay, so you have an assignment of every data point to one of the components. And if you wanted to divide the data into two groups, you'd use those component numbers to do so. Okay, now, what else should we look at? Well, one thing we should look at is the goodness of fit tests. What you see here is the result of something called a chi-square goodness of fit test. The chi-square test divides the range of the data into non-overlapping intervals and then compares the observed number of observations in each interval to the expected. So it says, according to this particular distribution, we would expect two observations to be less than 1.5 minutes. Well, there weren't any. On the other hand, there's an interval up here where we expect two and we observe six. Based upon that particular data set, we can come down to the bottom and look at the result of the chi-square test and it says, ah, there's a p-value of 0 0.00, okay? Not a very good fit, okay? Well, such is uh, probably what we expected. 
since things are not normally distributed, um, it doesn't like the fact that, you know, it doesn't have any observations in here where it probably should. Now, at this point, I could go ahead and ask for more components. If I push the right mouse button and go to analysis options, I can tell it, hey, go ahead and fit three components for me. Okay, now let me temporarily take away the combined PDF so you can just see the three components. If you ask for three components, okay, and it, it gives you one normal distribution here, another normal distribution here, and another normal distribution over here. And you can see what it's probably trying to do with that third distribution is pick up perhaps some of the skewness uh, in this particular distribution. I can even go farther. I can go to analysis options and perhaps ask for four components. Okay, now it has a component here, a component here, a component here, and a component over here. Okay, again, maybe it's modeling something real for different mechanisms, or maybe it's just trying to approximate the shape of the distribution. Now, one of the interesting questions we need to ask when we're doing this sort of modeling is how many components do we need? And in order to answer that question, there's a pane over here, a table called model comparisons. The model comparisons table will show you a comparison of a distribution with just one normal component, with two components, with three components, and with four components. Of particular interest are the three columns to the right. Okay. The Akaiki information criteria, the Bayesian information criteria, and the classification likelihood criteria. Now, <clears throat> According to the criterion, the smaller it is, the better the model. And just to make things a little more confusing, it looks like each of the criterion is selecting a different number of components. The Akaiki information criterion, you see, is minimized at four components, the Bayesian at three components and the classification criteria at two components. <laughs> now I was actually doing a little bit of reading this morning. I, you know, I was as I went through this presentation, um wondering, well, I wonder which of these criteria I should use. And I, I read an article uh this morning that said the following. It said that if the data really do come from normal distributions, okay? That the Bayesian information criterion is a good criterion to use for selecting the number of different components. However, it also said that if the data aren't normally distributed, that the Bayesian information criteria may overestimate the number of components. And you can see what was going on, right? As we added components to the distribution, it wasn't necessarily other real mechanisms going on. It was simply to model the shape of the distribution. They argued that if you were trying to cluster the data, okay? Uh, to classify each of the observations, that the classification likelihood criterion gave you a better choice 
of the number of components. That if your goal here was to divide the data into groups, right? Put half, not half of it, a part of the data in one group and a part of the data in another group and a part of the data in another group, that you should use the classification likelihood criteria to determine how many components to use. If the goal though is to get a good estimate of the density function, then the Bayesian information criterion was a good one to use. Okay, and you can see actually, if I come back here, right now I've estimated four components and I'm showing you each of the components. If I go to paint options here, I can say rather than showing me individual components, show me the combined PDF. I got rid of the four distributions, the four separate normal distributions now, and I'm simply showing you what the overall density function looks like. And you can see that's got a, sort of a weird wiggle in here. If I go back to analysis options, again, bring it back to three components, which the Bayesian information criterion suggested was good. I think you can see that that's a better approximation to the shape of the distribution. Now, as I said, we're working on linking in another R library, one that I just found recently, that will fit mixtures of non-normal distributions. Okay, and I'll um, I'll do another webinar once that gets uh, that gets released, and let's see if that does a little bit better uh, on this uh, old faithful data. Now, by the way, as I said, uh, what we are going to be doing now that we are on a subscription basis is we're going to be releasing new procedures as soon as they're developed. I'm not going to wait three years and do a big version 20. Okay, I'll, I'll be releasing new additions to stack graphics as soon as we get them um, developed, tested, documented, and so forth. Um, we have a, a, a couple coming very shortly. We've got uh, support vector machines. Uh, which are in the final stage of testing. Um, and uh, mixtures of non-normal distributions is something that uh, uh, we're also working on. So you can expect to see that uh, reasonably soon. Okay, anyway, um, that's how I would fit mixtures of normal distributions when I had a single variable. I now want to show you how I could do it when I had two variables. And I'm going to use the same data set, but I'm going to look at, in this case, the duration of the eruption and also the waiting time until the next eruption. So we're going to build now a bivariate model for duration and waiting time. Now, before I do that, I'm going to look at this data. So I'm going to go to Statlets, Density Estimators, Bivariate Density. First variable of interest is duration. Second variable is waiting time. Now, what you'll see initially is a histogram. Okay, you've got duration along one axis right? And you've got waiting time along the second. And in the space of those two variables, you see, again, there appear to be two components. You have short eruptions, after which the waiting time till the next eruption is relatively short, maybe 45 minutes or so. Then you have the longer eruptions, after which the waiting time for the next eruption is longer. So if you have a short eruption, you don't have to wait too long for the next. 
if you have a long eruption, then the waiting time is longer till the next eruption. Okay. Now, again, I can put a non-parametric estimator on this, uh, bring down the smoothing. Also, it's a good idea to increase the resolution here, make it look a little bit nicer. There we go. And you can see if I use a non-parametric density estimator here, that it definitely looks like there are two modes in this particular data. Now, what we want to do is to model this data using a mixture of bivariate normal distributions. Bivariate normal distributions, okay, have basically two means, two standard deviations, and a correlation coefficient. And you can see um, that they are reasonably well-defined, reasonably normal. In any direction that you look, you should see a bell-shaped curve if they are, in fact, bivariate normal distributions. Well, let's go ahead and, and model this. And to do that, I'll go back to interfaces, to distribution fitting, in this case, to bivariate mixture distributions. The first variable of interest will be duration. The second variable of interest, waiting time. Again, I need to tell it how many components I want, what initialization method to use, and then press OK. In this case, I'll simply ask for the analysis summary. Let's do the estimated parameters and also plot of the fitted distribution. All right. At that point, it called the EM cluster routine in R, and R fit this particular mixture of bivariate normal distributions. Okay, if you want to see the estimated parameters, they're pretty interesting. Again, uh, uh, about 35% of the data seem to belong to the first component that has a mean duration of about 2.0, two minutes, and you have to wait about 54.4 minutes for the next eruption of the geyser. About 65% of the data uh, come from a distribution with a mean of mean duration of 4.3 minutes, but then you have to wait 80 minutes to the next eruption. <clears throat> Overall, there are two means for each component, two standard deviations, and a correlation coefficient. Okay. One more picture I wanted to show you over here. Uh, this is the surface plot. If I push the right mouse button and go to Paint Options, I can ask instead of a surface plot for a contour plot, and I can have it display the points. And now you can see how the procedure would be used for clustering, right? You have a bunch of observations down here, all of which would be assigned to the first cluster, and a bunch of observations, more observations up here, that would be assigned to the second cluster. Okay. Now, incidentally, the new procedure we're working on uh, will allow us to not only fit non-normal distributions in the mix, but also deal with more than two variables. Okay. Right now, what we've introduced in version 19 are univariate and bivariate mixtures where the underlying components are normal. Okay, that is what I wanted to show you today. Um, if I go back to my uh, slides, and incidentally, you can find all these slides on our website. Um, you'll also see 
additional information uh, and additional videos. If you go to www.stackgraphics.com slash instructional underscore videos. All right, any questions? I have not seen any questions yet. All right, well, in that case, if you do have questions, you can send them to Neil, N-E-I-L, at stackgraphics.com, and I'll be happy to respond. And also, uh, we are open to suggestions of additional things you'd like us you'd like to see us put in stat graphics. Uh, most of what we add to the program is at the request of users. Uh, so please. Ah, one question. Okay. Uh, will it be possible to mix different types of distributions? Um, I, well, that's a good question. You mean whether you can mix one gamma distribution with one Weibull distribution? I believe that's possible in the new library that we're working with. Um, technically, I don't think that there is uh, much problem with that. I mean, it's doing an expectation maximization, so it's trying to maximize the likelihood. And uh, there's no particular reason why one component couldn't be uh, one type of distribution and a second component a different. Uh, I need to double check that. Okay. Second question, is there a difference between EM and maximum likelihood parameter estimates? Um, no, I, I, I think the expectation maximization is basically maximizing uh, the likelihood. Um, what you have in this case, of course, is, is, is not only figuring out the means and the standard deviations, but also determining those P's. How, what proportion of the observations fall into one component versus another. Okay, and that's a, uh, that requires a numerical search and uh, the starting values of the P's and the mu's and the sigmas uh, have a definite impact on uh, how well you do and whether or not you, you find the global optimum. So some of those initial conditions uh, had to do with uh, how you determine the starting points. But basically what you are trying to do is maximize the likelihood uh, of that combined distribution. All right, well, those, those were a couple questions. Um, all right, well, that, that seems to be it. So um, for those of you in the United States, enjoy Thanksgiving tomorrow. Uh, for those of you elsewhere, um, enjoy the rest of your day. So long. <laughs>